Hear now these words from a Christian hymn by Lloyd Stone. This is my song, O God of all nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge was given. God is own doth tend and nourish, in His holy courts they flourish, from all evil things He spares them, in His mighty arms He bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord His children sever. Unto them His grace He showeth, and their sorrows all He knoweth. Praise the Lord in joyful numbers, your protector never slumbers at the will of your defender. Every foeman must surrender. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. Is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy? More secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. Not yon star on high abiding, nor the bird in home nest hiding. Matthew twenty eight verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Good morning, Calvary. Today is a special day. Today is Youth Sunday, and we are also recognizing our graduates this Sunday, and so congratulations to all of them. And you get not one, but two sermons today. You get my sermon, which is going to be online only, and then you get Alyssa's sermon. And Alyssa's sermon is online, and people who are worshiping with us in person will get to hear Alyssa's sermon too. So, that's really exciting. You can go around and tell everyone that you heard two preachers this morning. 
But for my sermon, I wanted us to once again continue on talking about holy envy. And and we're not going to talk about Buddhism or Hinduism or Judaism or Islam today. Instead, we're going to talk about Christianity. I will never forget when I was a freshman in college, I took World Religions 101, um, and we had this book that was an overview of all the different world religions, and I'll never forget being eager to read the chapter on Christianity. Now, I had already read the chapter on all the other religions, and so I was curious to see what the one about Christianity, um, what it was going to say. And it started off in such a strange and bizarre way, so strange and bizarre, in fact, that, you know, however many years later, I still remember the beginning of this chapter. But it said, if an alien came down to Earth from their home planet and wanted to know what Christianity was like, they would be very confused. They wouldn't know where to go or what day to go or what time to go and they would notice a lot of significant differences. If you don't know what I mean by that, think about that for a second. Not all Christians worship in a church. Some Christians worship at homes. Some Christians worship at Salvation Armies. Some Christians worship outside under a tent. Not all Christians worship on Sunday. Not all Christians worship just one day a week. Not all Christians worship in the morning or in the evening or in the afternoon. Not all Christians have music. Not all Christians have the same type of music. Not all Christians have pews that they sit in or chairs. Not all Christians even have their minister look at them when they're leading worship. Many of our Orthodox brothers and sisters, the priests, has their back to the congregation the entire time. Not all Christians pray the same way. Can you imagine being an alien and coming down to earth and trying to figure out in one day what Christianity is all about? It would be impossible. And there are so many important things to note then about that. Think for a second about the baseline questions that you would want to ask someone of a different faith if you were hoping to have a conversation and learn more about the faith from that person. You might ask them, how do they pray? Or what do they believe happens when they pray? Or what do they think the main problem with humanity is? Or what does God want from them? Or what does a holy life look like? Those are all good, valid questions. Now think for a second about taking those questions and asking them of someone who is Christian. How would they answer those questions? 
you might be able to make a wild guess of how a Christian might answer those questions. You might be able to say how you would answer those questions. But whatever those answers are, whoever is the person who is speaking those answers, is that the totality of Christianity? Is one person's answer of what is prayer and what does prayer mean? Does that person speak for all of the Christian faith? Do all Christians agree with that person? I think what you would discover is that if you were asked a question, what do Christians think about X, Y, and Z? The only appropriate response would be, well, which Christians are you talking about? Because different Christians believe different things about the Bible and the Trinity and communion and baptism and even how many sacraments there are or what are the books in the Bible. All of these are things that we differ on. So as preposterous then as we would think it is for someone us to kind of be the spokesperson for all of Christianity and to be able to sum up the entire Christian faith and its breadth of diversity, as crazy as that is, think for a second then about how we do that to people of other faiths. We meet someone who is Hindu and we expect them to represent all of Hinduism for us. We meet someone who is Muslim, and we expect them to represent all of Islam for us. Or someone who is uh, Buddhist, or someone who is Jewish, or whatever the case may be. It's important for us to know that in this ocean of faith, there is a Christian ocean. And even in that Christian ocean, there are many, many different waves. One of the things that is really problematic in Christianity, though, is that there are lots of people who don't know that their wave is but just a small, tiny wave in the Christian faith. I remember having a conversation with someone once, and they said something really interesting to me. I was talking about wanting to go to seminary. So I'm in undergrad at the time. And I'm saying that when I graduate from college, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to become a minister. And they said, well, what kind of minister? And I said, Presbyterian minister. And her response was, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm Christian. And I said, I'm Christian too. Well, no, you're not. You're Presbyterian. Blew my mind (laughs) that someone wouldn't know that Presbyterianism is a type of Christianity. Or there are plenty of people who don't realize that being Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or whatever means that you're also Protestant. That there's this umbrella of Protestantism with all of these different denominations underneath it. And I can't tell you how many times many, many copious amounts of times, I have talked to someone who is of a Protestant faith tradition, and they tell me that Catholics aren't Christians. Uh, Just for the record, Catholics are the original Christians. They came before all of us. And so... Lots of times we don't even understand that our own church experience 
is different from others. And we don't understand that there are many different types of Christianity. Along with that, many of us don't understand the history of the Christian faith. If you were asked who Constantine was, you might not be able to answer the question, or who Zwingli was, or who Calvin was. And so what Barbara Brown Taylor did in her World Religions class is she gave everyone, and most people at this school identified as Christian, she would give all of them a quiz on basic Christian concepts and the history of the Christian faith. And she would give them this quiz before she started her four sessions on Christianity. And something interesting happened. Keep in mind she taught this course over and over and over again for years and years and years. What she noticed is that most of the class failed the quiz. Failed the quiz. Because they didn't know enough about their own faith. Sure, they knew about their own church experience or their own youth group experience or their own Bible study experience, but they didn't know the history of their faith. And oftentimes, they would walk around misinformed and think that their Christian experience was identical to everyone else's when it wasn't even remotely close to identical. So what do we say about that then? That most people kind of fail at Christianity. Do we need then to offer history courses so that everyone can pass a 10 question quiz? Is that the solution? Maybe. But what I think is even more problematic than people failing at understanding Christianity is how the reverse is also true. That it feels in a lot of ways like Christianity has failed us. That's the language that Barbara Brown Taylor uses. And what she means by that is that our churches, and not just Presbyterian churches, and not just mainline churches, but actually all churches, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And people who grew up in the church don't want to have anything to do with the church as an adult or people who have never been a part of the church really aren't interested in exploring and learning more about it and what Barbara Brown Taylor says is that in this way there's got to be something that is causing Christianity to fail us And she says that there's lots of things that people like to point out as failings of Christianity. For example, um, one of the things that she talks about is this overabundance of prosperity gospel preaching that perhaps that's the failing of the Christian church or uh, the rise and fall of mega churches perhaps that's the failing of the Christian church or you know there's all these different possibilities 
of why Christianity is failing. But the thing that she goes back to is that Christianity is failing us when we think about the rose. About how a rose gives off a beautiful fragrance and it attracts those around it. And those who are around it are drawn to it and want to experience it more. The failing of Christianity is that it's lost its fragrance. And for Barbara Brown Taylor, she thinks that the reason why Christianity has lost its fragrance is because of its words. Because we are so fixated on words, on talking to people and pushing people and trying to convert people and going on mission trips uh, and practicing evangelism. And it's just words upon words upon words upon words. And what she points out is that a rose never speaks. It's just its presence that is a warring to others. And then she talks about her own life and the people who made her come to the Christian faith. And if you don't know, she came to the Christian faith when she was about 25 years old. And it took a lot of people and a lot of experiences. But none of them, she said, did any talking. It was their presence that was like a rose to her. And when I was reading this, it made me start to think about my own experience in the church. And if I could summarize it, um, it would be this. I remember going to church it was a church of a, of a different denomination. But I remember going to church as a young child where the pastor preached hellfire and brimstone every single Sunday. And his words terrified me. And I never wanted to go. And I never wanted to be there. And then I had a period of my life where there was no church. And then I started going to church again, mainly out of obligation, my parents' sense of obligation of going to church and needing to be at church and taking their child with them to church. And then when I was in high school, it kind of felt like my world crumbled around me. My mom got sick. She was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And there were people in the church who were there for me. And they never sat down and talked to me about Jesus and why I need to believe in Jesus and what's going to happen to me if I don't believe in Jesus. But they did make me brownies. And they did give me hugs. And they did tell me that I could come over to their house anytime I just needed to get away. And then on the day that my mom died, I remember getting a phone call from a friend told me I needed to go outside and I went outside and there in my front yard were about 30 people from my church and a couple of them had guitars and they just stood in my yard and sang 
some songs. This Christian hymn and this Christian song. And then when they were done, no one said a word. They just all got in their cars and vans and drove away. But that moment of those people standing on my yard and letting me feel my sadness and feeling it with me, that moment changed my life for forever. And so as, you know, maybe angry and defensive as I would get upon, you know, hearing from Barbara Brown Taylor that Christianity is is failing and these are all the things that are wrong with Christianity and that uh, we need to think less about our words and more about our being and our presence with other people. Is angry and defensive as I get when I read all of that when I then pause and take a step back and look at my own life I think she's absolutely right because those brownies and those hugs and those invitations and that moment standing in my yard The smell of the rose was so sweet. And that's what did it. So then Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say that even though Christianity is failing and it may appear as if Christianity is failing us, that that may actually be a good thing. That it may be exactly what we need, what the world needs in order to start over again. Or to get back to what really matters, which isn't using scare tactics or extreme verbiage to get people to become part of our team, but rather to live in this loving, Christ-like way and allowing others to be attracted to the fragrance of our rose. And I think that as hard as all of this may be to hear, that perhaps we may fail at our own religion, that perhaps our own religion may be failing us, rather than being anxious or worried, I think if we think on the things and focus on the things then that we can control, as opposed to the things we can't control, that we will be in a much better position. Can we control what every church in the world is doing. No. Can we control as much as we would like the things that our fellow Christian brothers and sisters say? No. Not always. Can we control ourselves? And can we focus on living a life like a rose? Absolutely. And so that's what we should do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hello, I'm Alyssa, and I've been attending Calvary for three years. Welcome to Youth Sunday. Today is a very special day for the youth because we have taken over. Today, I will share with you what I value as a youth and my new view on the world and the Bible. More specifically, I'm going to talk about the idea of being open-minded. Today's scripture passage for my sermon is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19 to 22. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit, 
Do not scoff at prophets, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Over the past few weeks, Pastor Millicent has been preaching a sermon series called Holy Envy and how we can learn from other religions. I want to emphasize the value of learning from others and being open to and inspired by new ideas. It's important to be inspired by their ideas and their parallels to our religion and beliefs. We should also all be open to the idea that we can be wrong. This applies to any aspect of life, politics, faults in our relationships, what justice looks like, and interpretations of the Bible. I encourage testing these ideas, comparing them to our faith in God's word. Once we do this, it isn't the end. The world and situations are changing, and we, and we need to change with it. The way we understand the world is incomplete, and as we understand it more, there are things that we thought were true that might not be. We need to refer to God and his word for wisdom as we gain new information. I encourage you to think about your deepest beliefs, one that you were taught very young and question them. The herd mentality isn't always the best mentality. What may seem obvious and what everyone else around you believes might not be right. There are so many biases that shape our opinions of the world and we never question them because it has always been a part of our lives. A great example of this is media bias. When news stations, articles, or even social media posts only show information for one side of a story or, the sto or word the story in a certain way, it directs you to an opinion. It's important to be mindful of this whenever we get new information. This way, we are responsible for the problems in our world. It's also important to be open to, to help from sources that we trust. There is an idea where I see where adults say, I'm an adult now. I can't rely on anyone else. I have to be independent. Even when I look at myself and my peers, I see a similar idea that I'm a teenager now. I'm going to have to stop relying on anyone else. This is all not true. Everyone is different and skilled and experienced in different things. For example, I had never written a sermon before this. So Ashley gave me helped me format my general ideas and gave me advice. Just like we can learn from others, we, can, we all have something to offer our community. Others can and will learn from us. Observational learning is learning and, uh, and applying what you see. This seems obvious, but it's also important to know we are and need to be able to be influenced, but we are also an influencer. Being open-minded allows us to accept new ideas and change our opinions to, to, be, to be better equipped for our ever-changing world. Thank you. When we see the body of Christ still broken in this world, may we meet it with lavish grace and pour ourselves out with extravagant love. Yeah.
of Christ that passes all understanding. Amen. <laughs>